Hello, my name is Sumi Somaskanda, and welcome to the second live broadcast of Histicon 2021, organized by the Federal Agency for Civic Education, funded by Germany's Foreign Office. And we're here again in the Rheinbeckhallen here in Berlin, and we again have a great program for you over the next hour, a live program with musical performances, with games, interactive pieces, chats with our experts as well. And I'm really happy to be leading you through the next hour again with uh, my co-host Vasily Golad. So Vasily, tell us about uh, the theme of this show. Thank you, Sumi. In this episode, we are going to explore the meaning and the importance of remembrance. History never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. This is what Mark Twain once said, and this is why the culture of remembrance is so important. History is not only about dates. Of course, dates are important, but it's more about understanding why certain things have happened. And this was the main reason why I decided to study history. Sumi, what's your connection with that topic? Well, remembrance is a fascinating topic to me. We live and work in a country where memory culture is embedded in society. There is a general consensus around it. I come from a country the, in the US where there's almost an intransigent inability to look back. You only look forward. So it's so interesting to see the different ways that countries and societies go around remembering. That's something we're going to talk about through the course of the next hour. How do we remember? What do we remember? How does remembrance change over time? And what can young people around the globe learn from the past? That's something we're going to talk about with our experts, Eva Hassel from the innovation hub Haifa in Israel, and Sarah Jones from the University of Birmingham. They'll look at the future of remembrance and how digital media might change that. And Vasily, we're both excited. We're going to have another uh, musical live performance, several performances in the show from the R&B singer-songwriter Mulai. And I want to, at this point, greet our watch party partner for this show, uh, sitting at home in Japan, Israel, and Germany, watching us right now and contributing. We'll come to you a little bit later. And also, we have art here in this room already going on. Yesterday, that was a white wall, and now we see a lot of tape on it. This is Tape That, an artist collective from Berlin. They work with adhesive tapes. Can you tell me, Nikki, what can we see so far? Yeah, actually we see three different kind of styles and now we work on the hatching and each of the styles stands for one of the topics of the show. What's, what's your favorite uh, style out of these? I mean, all of them has his own meaning, so I cannot really have a favorite one. I'm very curious to see how it will look like in the end, uh, after the third show, in the end of the, sh the third show, so we will come back to you. I won't disturb you any longer. And Histocon is... Um, an interactive platform. So we want to interact with you. We want to know your thoughts, your question regarding remembrance. And therefore, we have our community host, Esther. You are in touch with the people outside. Uh, tell us more about what you know so far. It will do. Um, hi, Histocon community. It's great to be here again today. Um, your first question is, what important event in world history did you witness yourself? So, for example, I vividly remember the Rwandan genocide unfolding on TV. Um, so if you want to let us know what important event you remember, you can go to www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and type in the new code, it's different from yesterday, 174076. Three, two. And we're also going to share that in the YouTube comment section and you can contribute through the live chat or in the comment section here on YouTube. So I'll share some of your responses later in the show. Thank you very much, Esther. Some historians say we live in an age of remembrance. Never before did we create so many different ways to remember historical events, names, dates. But why is it important to remember? That's the main question. And the next video animation created by animator Magda Krebs and Lea Mayeran tries to give us an explanation. Why is remembrance important? Jewish author, philosopher, Holocaust survivor and Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel gives an explanation why remembrance might be essential for us. Without memory, there's no culture. Without memory, there would be no civilization, no society, no future. Remembrance helps us to better understand previous generations, to try and learn from the past and apply that knowledge into the present. 
As individuals, we collect memories through experiences we make and share with others. As a social group, we collectively remember our past in different ways of political and cultural tradition. This includes commemorating historical events, personalities or places. We visit museums and memorials, read books, watch films, name streets and places, celebrate Remembrance Days and cultivate symbols and rituals. Individually and collectively, remembrance is crucial for our identity and creates a sense of social belonging. But remembrance changes and evolves over the course of time. Remembering the past is not consensual and may differ from generation to generation, nation or cultural background. Who gets to tell the story and who is heard belongs to the most difficult, sometimes painful, but also worthwhile questions. It is not surprising that remembrance culture is defined by a variety of perspectives, experiences, voices and formats. Many stories are yet to be heard. Including these unheard voices and giving justice to victims enriches our collective memory. It serves as a source of empowerment, empathy and solidarity. Which events do you consider memorable and why is remembrance important to you? These are very important questions and we would like to hear your opinions and answers to those questions in a few minutes. This year, Prince Philip has died and um, I was in front of Buckingham Palace when the news broke. He was a very controversial person um, and after his death there was a new big debate going on that started about the future of the royal family, how the royal family needs to reform, how they need to address their personal history. That was an event um, that somehow let me think a lot this year. Sumi, had, have you had an event like that that uh, started uh, to, to, to work something out in your mind? I would certainly say journalistically, I went to Bosnia to cover the 20th anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide. And it was an illuminating experience to witness a place where they were supposed to come together to remember, but who is allowed to remember was so contested. That's something that really stuck with me. Now, if we look forward, we saw in the video how we use books, for example, to remember and to look back into the past. If you love books like I do, then you would probably know that the Frankfurt Book Fair, one of the biggest book fairs in the world, is taking place right now in the city of Frankfurt. And the Federal Agency for Civic Education actually has a mobile booth there. And we have a correspondent there who's going to be telling us about how things are going. So I want to say hello to the correspondent Marie-Thérèse Grüne. Hello, Marie. Hello from Frankfurt. <laughs> Great to see you. So tell us how things are there. Um, really good today. It's super sunny outside. It's a little bit windy. Um, but it's super nice and the atmosphere is great. People are just happy to be here again after one and a half years without book fairs. So, um, yeah, it's great to be around. So tell us more about what the um, Federal Agency for Civic Education with this mobile booth has organized at the book fair. Yes, so normally we would have like a big area inside the book fair. But this year we decided to have a little booth outside and we have like some publications and people come by and talk to us about like civic education and like learn about us. And um, yeah, we can just like chat and um, like meet the people who are also here. But we also have some like events for those who are at home and um, who are not able to join and they can like um, listen to our um, and like watch our live stream that is also on YouTube. Well, lucky for you that it's not raining then, since your booth is outside this year. Yeah. Uh, Marie, is remembrance a topic in general at this year's book fair? Um, yes, definitely. I mean, you can like really feel like Corona is like still like over like the main topic, like totally. But um, I was able to talk a little bit with people at our bus about like Histocon. I was telling them about the live stream and um, I asked some questions and I would like to read them out. So um, I asked one person, what places or events do you consider memorable? And that this um, was a person who was originally from Israel. And he said, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Holocaust Memorial is really important for him to understand survivors and their families' needs. Another person read, 
I think important events in German history in the last years are the dates related to the growth of anti-Semitism and racism, like the NSU, Hanau and Halle. And the third um, card I would like to read out um, refers to the question, why is remembrance important to you? And she said, for me, it is important to remember historical events in order to be aware of tensions in our society that could potentially lead to similar incidents. Very interesting, uh, Marie. Just a quick last question to you. What does remembrance mean to you? Um, remembrance means for me to like, um, especially like for events or for like dates, for example, the 3rd of October, to like have a break from my daily life and like reflect the past and like hmm, what happened maybe 30 years ago and like be aware of like what events like just like shape the future also. And since we're looking ahead here also in this next hour, how do you think remembrance can be uh, brought in the future, into the future? Um, I would say definitely like a dialogue and talk to people. And of course, also, I mean, you can open like a book and read about it, but like to be in contact and also to talk to other people from different countries to get a different like perspective or a different view is just like so crucial for like our society. And our very last question to you, Marie, since you're at the book fair, your favorite author? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, I just read Mamanda Ngozi Adichie's Americana. Oh, yes. And it's just like a great book. And um, I would recommend everyone to read that. <laughs> well, I certainly share that sentiment with you. Okay, thank you so much, Marie-Therese Grüne, uh, with us from the Frankfurt Book Fair. Have a great time there. Bring back some books for us and we will see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And we can cross over to Esther now to get an update on what the Histocon community is saying. Yes, so let's have a look at the word cloud. So the question was, what important event in world history did you witness yourself? And we've got some interesting answers. So um, one answer was 9-11 was the first we all witnessed, as it was meant by the perpetrators to be witnessed through mass media. And I certainly remember that one and the impact it did have across the globe. Um, we also have the fall of the Berlin Wall and watching that on TV as a puzzled child. And then one of our viewers has put COVID-19, I guess, um, even though that's a, an ongoing event that's happening at the moment, it still has a huge impact. There's been like a change in what has happened throughout the pandemic. So there's different things to, to, uh, yeah, to remember and to look back on. Yeah, we're making memories in the present as yeah. this pandemic is continuing to shape our lives. Okay, thanks, Esther. So, you know, Vasily and I were bo both born well after the end of World War II. So we have to depend on external sources to learn about the past to remember. So for me, I, I like to interview people who were perhaps close to the events. I also like to watch documentaries and listen to podcasts. So, Vasily, what kind of sources do you use to remember that time? I prefer to go to museums that are located in places where historical events actually took place. For example, in the area of the former concentration camp Bergen-Belsen, you can explore, you have the opportunity to explore everything with a tablet. Um, the place was burned down, so there is not much left, but digital media offers you the opportunity to explore this historical site by looking at the structures of the former camp through a digital lens. And you see images, graphics, uh, you hear sound bites from contemporary witnesses that are connected to the place itself. But we don't only want to talk about our thoughts, our experience and our connection to remembrance. We also asked young people in Israel, Japan and Germany what they think about remembrance. What are their most valuable sources to remember history and how does looking back help to think ahead? What is remembrance? For me, uh, the stories of my grandparents and the friends and also just watching movies really helped me understand history and, and get a sense of what happened. I think that looking back did teach uh, my community that uh, in order to survive you need to be strong and uh, you need to protect yourself, which is one of the things that helped us plan ahead for some scenarios. Um, 
情報を得ることがとても増えました。I want them to remember not only the historical facts, but also the reasons why they have occurred, especially when it comes to something regrettable like wars or human rights violations. I think it's important to see both sides of the coin and to think about the other side in every historical event and to better understand what drove them to behave in a specific way. I recently found letters from my grandparents from World War II. And although they have been dead for over 20 years now, I'm getting to know them in a completely different way, and that's so interesting for me. In the current culture of remembrance, I would love to change that, especially all people have the opportunity to share their experiences and thoughts about situations that happen in their life, because I would like to come in dialogue with them. And、um, I think that only if we come in this dialogue, we can change something in the future and now, and also in the culture of remembrance. What I would change about the culture of remembrance is I would make sure to give less books, less history lessons, and give more people、um, people speaking, people's stories, people lecturing about different things in the history. And that way, people can relate to easily, such as myself. Thank you very much for that contribution from Japan, Israel, and Germany. And we want to hear your personal stories as well, what remembrance means to you. So make sure to comment in our live chat. Now, commemoration, memory, these are things that change over time. It's a dynamic process that depends very much on the context that we're living in. How we remember is different than how our grandparents remember. And intergenerational remembrance is a subject that our next live partner, Israel, has put into a memorial and a museum called Beit Terezin. It's a place of commemoration that was founded by the survivors of the Ghetto Theresienstadt in 1955. And we can now connect live to the director. A bit to the scene in Israel. Hello, Tammy Kinberg. Hello, how are you? It's great、really、to have you to with us.、Here. Yeah, we're very happy to have you be part of Histocon 2021. So, I'm going to ask you about Beit Terezin. It's a meeting place for different generations, as we just said. They're supposed to come together and learn from the experience of Holocaust survivors. Why was it important for the founders to create this intergenerational space? Um, let me share with you a presentation that I prepared, and you shall see in the foundation scroll. Just a moment, let me just share it. So, this is the place, this is our uh, um, exhibition. Um, and here you can see the foundation scroll. And、uh, I just、uh, took a part of it that will give you an answer to your question. And this is what they wrote. We did not want to erect a statue or a sculpture to commemorate them, the people who perished, their beloved.、Uh, an object that will symbolize indeed the past suffering, but will not serve as a bridge to the future. So they really wanted to have a living place, a place, and they also write it in the foundation scroll where young people will come and discuss and、uh, understand what happened and why it happened. Tammy, thanks for sharing that with us. I mean, how do you then enable younger generations to engage with history there? Tell us more about that. Okay, so、um, if you look、uh, at the left side, you can see、uh, the faces of、uh, some of our survivors, the founders of the place. And、uh, those photos are part of a, a contemporary project that is taking place now in Beit Terezin. And、uh, a young e r Uh, artists, uh, video artists, which are third generation, meaning their grand- grandparents were、uh, survivors of the Holocaust, they decided that they would like to、um, take the stories of the survivors, connect them with uh, uh, artists, and make an artwork out of their stories. And、uh, they like to emphasize a notion, a feeling,、uh, some idea that came from the story, not.、Uh, not Uh, the historical facts or details, which are sometimes kind of boring <laughs> for young people. So they really want to, and this is our idea, to concentrate on the story itself, on what the people felt or understand, or what are their,、um, um, what they thought about what happened. What do young people there, Tammy, tell you about this way of remembering? Is it something that really Touches them, and what do they tell you that they've learned? Okay, so this、uh, b r i n g me to the next um, um, slide. And、uh, this is the, the idea of the workshop that we planned. 
Uh, you can see on the right side, this is the floor of the place that you see behind me, the, the permanent exhibition of Beit Terezi. And uh, this uh, beautiful floor, mosaic floor, depicts the, the uh, map of the ghetto. It's really a town, a town that, called, that is called Terezi in Czech. And the whole town became a ghetto. So this was made when the, when the exhibition was erected in the late 60s. And on the left side, you can see the idea um, of the workshop. In the workshop that we plan, uh, young people are coming, they're meeting a survivor, hearing the story, uh, have a discussion about remembrance and commemoration. And then they make their own mosaic. And you can see um, below the picture of those two young girls um, what they chose to do. And uh, they took the story and they, um, they took the uh, essence or the idea that uh, they could find in a certain piece. And you can see brotherhood and you can see freedom and so on. So really people, young people... Uh, communicate by uh, understanding what is the meaning of what happened and how we are supposed to deal with it and how we would like to live in the future. And Tammy, just one more question. Can you tell us why it's important to have this be an intergenerational space? It's a conversation we're happening, having rather here in Germany as well, how we can pass things on to the next generations. Well, the problem that we are now facing or the situation is that uh, the first generation, people who were there and can tell us the story, which is the most, uh, uh, most important way to, to, to understand, they are, you know, they are passing away. And we are trying to understand what is the right way to continue and tell the story because uh, the people who, who experienced it are not, no longer with us. So how can we do it in a way that will also appeal to the young generation and they will find it interesting and important. And uh, there are several ways we try to do it, like I showed before. Okay, Tammy Kunberg, thank you so much for joining us live Here's from Israel and sharing those experiences with us, which I think are really valuable. So thank you so much, Tammy. Thank you too. So let's cross over again to our community manager, Esther, who has been looking at what's happening in the Histocon community. So we posed the question in our live chat, why is remembrance important to you? And we've got some really interesting answers. So first of all, um, to help understand not only our own culture, but his of history, politics um, as well, but that of other people and um, that of other people who have different backgrounds to us. Um, to learn from past mistakes and to acquire knowledge, we would not be able to create and be a, a better future without looking back. And lastly, as someone from Germany, I truly think it's our duty to remember, and I always hope remembrance culture can help us never to forget about our crucial past, especially the Holocaust. And that's all for today. So thank you everyone for your input. And I think we've had some really great insight. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Esther. And certainly continue to comment in our live chat. I'm gonna take you back onto the main stage now because I wanna show you something on our big wall here on the stage. As we just heard from Tammy Kinberg, we're living in a time where Holocaust survivors are slowly disappearing. That means their voices are disappearing with them. And losing witnesses means that we're losing invaluable archives and memories. But there are many ways to preserve these memories and digital media can really help. It gives us more options to keep history alive uh, for future generations. As Tammy said, that's one of the most crucial parts of our work. So here what we're looking at on the screen is a, a variety of digital remembrance projects. You can see the, the different images here. Um, for example, on TikTok, you have Holocaust survivors sharing their experiences and their lessons with young people. That's one way to pass their message along. And our next topic revolves around the question of how the future of remembrance might look. So I will hand over to Vasily and his guest. Thank you, Sumi, and good to have you here, Eva Hazel. Hello. Hello. You are currently working together with the innovation hub Haifa in Israel. Can you 
tell us more about what it is. So it's an innovation hub for Holocaust commemoration and education at the University of Haifa. And yeah, we were our group of people who were dealing with history, so the history of the Holocaust, but also with the future, um, the future of commemoration, because it will be a future with more and more digitalization, globalization, and um, of course with less and less witnesses and survivors. And yeah, each of us was uh, developing a project, um, thinking of ideas of how to deal with that, and yeah, basically how to make history future-proof, um, and also maybe in ways that are more inclusive um, and accessible. And you are working on a very interesting app regarding the future of history, regarding how to deal with history in the future. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, yeah, so I'm in the process of developing an augmented reality app that shows places of Jewish life and culture in Berlin or in other European cities before the war. Um, yeah, I, maybe I should explain what augmented reality yeah, is. Yeah, the difference. So it's not like going around with glasses and being yeah. in a different world. This is virtual reality. That's virtual reality, exactly. And augmented reality is uh, many might know Pokemon Go, um, where you would open your phone camera and you would see the actual view, but there was a little Pokemon somewhere that Collect Pokemon. Yeah. isn't yeah. there in reality. That's augmented reality. Um, so there's something added to reality. And... Um, I'm doing that with historical photographs. So we're using historical photographs and the user would stand somewhere in Berlin, for example, on the street and see um, on another layer through his phone camera what was there once, where he's standing now. Um, so there are buildings from the outside, buildings from the inside, people who were walking these streets, um, living there, working there. And yeah, so users could explore the first Turkish community, for example, of Berlin, which was actually Jewish, or the former fashion district, which has vanished, and just yeah, explore places like that. It reminds me a bit the project in Bergen-Belsen I've uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and I know about that project that some historians are critical. They say it's, you, you shouldn't mix history with this kind of technology. What, what would you answer them? Um, yeah, I, partly I would agree. I think you have to be very careful with that. And I was, I always, I, I thought about that a lot actually while developing the idea that um, I, I don't really like creating the illusion of reality or, you know, or, or the feeling of bringing something back to life. I personally don't think that that's a good idea because Holocaust denial is actually just right around the corner. And if you start like that, you know, people who don't mean well might say, oh, so, but if this isn't true, um, then what else isn't? And, you know, I, I don't think it's a good idea to fill the historical gaps that we have um, with fantasy or your own creation. And that's why I chose to strictly use photographs or just the original historical sources, basically, and not to fill the gaps. Mm -hmm. And what would you say are the advantages of, of this format you, you, you mentioned right now? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it's actually showing the contrast of the past and the present. So maybe it's not as shocking, you know, as, as as seeing something really horrible from from a concentration camp, for example. But I think it can be, and and I've already run some test tours, and so far my my impression is that it can be really impressive on a more low key level. Um, because people can actually basically physically feel what has been lost. And we all know how it ended. You don't even have to spell it out. Um, and I think that sometimes can be even more impressive than, you know, like the huge shock. Or How can young people participate in your project? I mean, I'm, I'm of course, always looking for people who are uh, willing to go on test tours. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I have to say, I'm working with a great startup from Berlin. It's called Sauber. So they've been really supportive and um, developed a prototype for me so far. But um, right now, we're also looking for funding to take it to the next step and to really yeah, make it go public. Um, so... You, you also mentioned earlier that you uh, work with Holocaust witnesses. Um, you do interviews uh, with them. Um, how do you use digital media to make these interviews more accessible for young people? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't do these interviews myself, but I'm working but you, with the archive with um, exactly at, at, a, at a German uh, memorial site with um, video testimonies of survivors of this camp. 
Um, yeah, so, so we are actually, right now it's work in progress, we'll be launched 9th of November. Um, we'll be a learning platform where students can, um, yeah, it, it allows them to, to learn at their own pace, according to their own interests. So it's a very non-linear way, which I think also digital, digital media is actually great for. You should use it for things like that. Um, and we're just using, yeah, little snippets and it's more like a network of knowledge you can navigate your way through it because I think a three hour long video interview with a person who's just sitting there just talking, um, it's very unusual, especially for young people to watch something like that. And I think the threshold can be so high that you would just not even start. And I think, yeah, we were just trying to offer maybe a, a gateway inside and then you can dive deeper if you want to. We touched the topic already, the challenges in creating digital projects around Holocaust memory. Um, what would you say, if you put it in a nutshell, what, what are the biggest challenges in your work? With dig in regards to digital media? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, first of all, yeah, what I already said, I think the, the big boundary for me personally is bringing something back to life. I think for me personally, that's a no-go. Um, less dramatic, but I see it a lot, is um, using technology just for the sake of it. I've seen so many apps, for example, where you would actually just scroll through and it's just text and pictures. I, I could have printed that out as a PDF. That would be exactly the same. I'm just looking at it on my phone. Um, and I think that's actually a waste and a shame. So I, so I think technology should serve a purpose. Um, and yeah, and, and there are a million ways to get creative with that, actually. Thank you very much, Eva Hassel, for your perspective. Very interesting to use the advantages of digital media. It's not the end of our conversation because we have prepared a little game. It's called Memorable Memorials and we would like you to play against our community host Esther. And this is why we go to the main stage. There are some strange memorials in the world with questionable stories behind and we selected three of them, of which you have to guess the right answer to the story. I hope I do better than yesterday. <laughs> yeah, Vincent was very good, he knew everything. I'll read out the questions and you choose between two possible answers. You have 10 seconds maximum for each answer. I check the time with my phone and To the Histocon community, you can also participate just in the comment section below. So, we start with the first question. I start the 10 seconds, of course, only when it's time for the answers. Okay, so first, are you ready? Ready. <laughs> Many countries have monuments to the unknown soldier except Iceland, which does not have its own army. It has instead a monument to the unknown A, Troll commissioner or B, bureaucrat? 10 seconds. B. I say B too, yeah. Okay, you, you guys have three more seconds. Two, one. All right. The correct answer is B. This statue by Magnus Thomason is a reminder of the trivial existence of a faceless official. However, in Reykjavik, these seemingly anonymous workers are immortalized in art. One, one. Very good. We go to the second question. So, the statue Heiwa no Chikai in front of Tokyo's Oimachi station is intended to represent an oath for peace. Twitter users in Japan, however, interpreted the statue differently. For them, it represents A, a mother taking away her son's internet privilege, or B, a tribute to Yoko Ono and John Lennon. 10 seconds from now. A. A. I'm going to say B. Oh. The peace element. <laughs> and that's it. So A, B. And the correct answer is, sorry, Esther, it's A. If you look closely at the bird, you may notice its similarity to the Twitter logo. That is why it was interpreted as a mother taking away her son's Twitter account. Okay. So it's two, one. And we are coming to the final question. That will be very interesting. Why are several monuments to Wojtek the Bear in Scotland? A, after his career as a soldier in World War II, he retired there. Or B, 
Wojtek was a well-known whiskey smuggling bear and is honored for his service throughout Scotland. Okay, I, I'd say B. I'm going to say A. Stay on Ooh, theme. Interesting. <laughs> Three, two, one. You said? A. You said B? The correct answer is A. Wojtek served in the Polish two corps. He was even promoted to corporal for his achievements. He unmasked a spy, among other things. After the war, he spent his retirement at Edinburgh Zoo. So 2-2, two, two, congratulations. <laughs> We're very well done. And now, get ready for some good music. Our next performer is a talented alternative R&B singer-songwriter who lives in Berlin. Please welcome Mulai. This way, you don't owe me to stay. It will never be the same. I lost myself in the temptation. Always run to the wrong places. No time for consideration. I crave the high modern salvation. Set over the line, but the other side called for me. I needed a try, take a bite, find out who I wanna be. Always had to take it a little further, a little higher. A waste of myself as a fighter, <laughs> an untamed tiger, filled with desire. You know you like that about me. Don't lie, you like that about me. <laughs>
hurts the only pain I know it's worth I got this now I'm wearing scars for a thousand lives A part of me so I survived I got this now The truth hides in between the shades Of darkest nights and brightest days I got this now And even if you're scared to find your soul lost in the interest side, you'll figure it out. Hey, cause we first gotta burn like a phoenix. Hey. We first gotta burn like a phoenix. Ooh, yeah. First gotta burn like a phoenix. First gotta burn like it's a phoenix. Yeah, like it was. You called me a whore, you called me a bitch So I used to shock when I live up to it Please blame it on me, if that helps you heal If you cut me out, make sure you cut deep I made mistakes, I cannot change And you said things you can't take away Come on, make sure that I felt the pain Come on, make sure I rose from the flames I'm holding on to how it hurts I only think I know it's worth I got this now I'm wearing scars from thousand lives, a part of me, so I survived. I got this now. Guess we first gotta burn like a phoenix, hey. We first gotta burn like a phoenix, ooh, yeah. First gotta burn like a phoenix. First gotta burn like it's a phoenix, yeah, like you a phoenix. Like it's a phoenix, like a phoenix, like a mm. Like it's a phoenix, like a phoenix, like a oh, oh. Like it's a phoenix, like a phoenix, like a mm. Like you're a phoenix, like a phoenix, like a oh, oh. Moolai, thank you very much for that impressive performance. Thank you. Your aim is to create music that lasts. Um, watching you, I would describe it uh, more than music. It's, it's a performance, it's a, a different form of art. Um, how, what, what, what do you feel when you do this? How would you describe your art? Well, I think in the end, the most important thing is to really just try to express what's inside of you and um, whatever medium you feel like, you know, fits and can express that. And, um, I'll try I try to use so yeah, that's for me and how do you want people to remember your art in let's say 100 years? Oh wow well, I would hope that people would remember me as an artist that always stayed true to herself and um, really created her own artistic universe and hopefully also as a Strong female figure to be inspired by Mulai, thank you very much. We thank will you. hear and see you again in the end of the show and now Back to you, Sumi. Thanks, Fastili, and also to Malai and Ben for those performances. Looking forward to the end of the show for those uh, further performances. Now I'm going to take you down into our little living room here for our next topic, because we have a talk with another expert. Uh, we heard in the interview with Eva Hassel that teaching history through digital media does have a lot of advantages, but there are some important challenges to take into account as well. And that's what we're going to discuss now with researcher and professor Sarah Jones from the University of Birmingham. Sarah, good to see you. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Great to have you here at Histicon. Now, as I was just saying, you know, you've written about uh, using digital media to remember. So you wrote a critical article last year about a Holocaust TikTok trend that went viral. And essentially what this was is that teenagers uploaded videos of themselves pretending to be Holocaust um, victims. They, they even used makeup to simulate their bruises and such. So tell us what you found uh, questionable about this. Um, yeah, so, so they were dressing up as the emergent Holocaust uh, victims to look and, and acting out scenes, including, for example, um, Holocaust victims going to heaven. Um, so just to say my criticism wasn't with the medium itself. I think the digital media, including TikTok, hold a, a great deal of potential for remembrance, as, as we've already heard. Um, I think my concern was really uh, with the way that medium was, was used in this particular context, and uh, especially the role playing um, that was that was happening in the videos. Um, so, uh, as we've already heard, Holocaust in Holocaust education, 
we actually tend to advise educators, teachers to avoid encouraging students um, to take on the role of, um, of victims or indeed perpetrators. Um, and there are important reasons for that. Um, so sometimes I think educators feel that, that role playing is a kind of easy win. Um, it's a really seems to be a way of, of, of generating empathy and understanding um, for, for victims. Um, but it's um, on the one hand, it, it's, it's ethically problematic. Um, so it's, it's kind of taking on appropriating the experience, uh, an experience of suffering that, that's not your own. Um, it's also um, quite dubious if, if we want um, students to believe that they, they've had those experiences as well. Um, and, and indeed, Holocaust survivors uh, found um, the, the TikTok trend, uh, or many Holocaust survivors found the TikTok trend um, deeply offensive, uh, and we need to take their views into consideration. And I'm also not convinced that that kind of role playing has the intended effect, if the intended effect is, is about Holocaust education. Um, so when, when we think about empathy, we need to think about it as something that's actually really complicated and, and has lots of different meanings. Mm. Um, and the kind of empathy that, that we want to kind of encourage in Holocaust education is an empathy that um, is not focused on the self, it's, it's focused on the other person and what they're feeling as themselves. So imagining their experiences and their emotions as they would have experienced them and not as we are experiencing them. And role playing, I don't think, can really foster that kind of engagement with history, that kind of remembrance um, that also allows a kind of critical engagement with history, thinking about um, the causes um, of, of the genocide in this case. So take us one step further and help us understand what that might look like, because as Eva Hassel said earlier, there are great opportunities to engage young people with digital forms of remembrance. So what are good examples of that, good opportunities? Um, yeah, so digital, um, so, so there's, there's almost always a kind of panicked response to any new medium and the use of any new medium um, for remembrance, but also for education. And I think what we need to be thinking, as you say, is not what the medium is, but, but how we're we using it. Um, so there, there's, there's lots of potential for digital remembrance, and we've heard about some of them um, already at Histocon. Um, so they engage younger audiences using using a medium that they're they're really familiar with, um, and whatever um, Hazel said about uh, non-linear forms is really important. Um, so in a kind of hyperlinked world, um, young people are used to engaging um, with media, not it, not in that kind of linear format. And it's important that um, as as people concerned with Holocaust education that that we respond to that. Um, there's also um, the kind of potential of digital forms to be um, more de democratic in some ways, in that um, we can have a much broader reach and, and people can engage uh, remotely. Um, so all you need is an, an internet connection um, and people can contribute their own their own remembrance as well, which I think is important. Right. Um, the risks there, of course, are distortion and, and the risk of Holocaust denial. In terms of good examples, um, I think the, the um, Holocaust Education Institutes in the UK, um, which I'm most familiar with, um, have done some really good work over the COVID-19 pandemic um, to engage their audiences digitally, particularly um, digitally with, with different forms of, of eyewitness testimony, first person testimony. Um, and uh, I'd probably name in particular the Forever Project at the National Holocaust Centre and Museum um, which is, um, it's, it's not the only one of its kind, but it, um, it's um, uh, using innovative technology in order to recreate the experience of a dialogue with the Holocaust survivor. Um, and um, the Forever Project, they're particularly thinking about um, the ethics and the methods of doing that in, um, uh, in, a, in a way that's productive as, as we'd want it to be. To drill down into the point that you made about empathy earlier and generating empathy among the youth in remembrance projects, what is the right way to create that em empathy and respectfully remember traumatic events like the Holocaust in digital media? In digital media specifically. Um, so uh, perhaps if I stick with, with the Forever Project. So um, as, as an example, and I think we've also had some others that do, that do it well. So one thing I think is to avoid, um, to avoid role playing. Um, so to avoid um, virtual reality, which is, as we've heard, is very different to augmented reality, um, but also um, to create a space for critical thinking, um, so for critical engagement. 
Um, and that that means kind of framing the digital remembrance within the context, within within a broader educational context as well, so that, that students can um, learn about the history that led up to, for example, if we're talking about the Holocaust, learn about lives afterwards, um, and really have that space to think about the causes. Um, so if we think about what we, we want Holocaust education to do, um, for me, it's it's um, you know it's it's learning from the past in 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 order to prevent recurrence. It's about justice for victims, about justice for the survivors, um, but it's also about creating solidarities across ethnic and national borders. Um, so we need to kind of create a kind of empathy that allows us to see other people as other people, but nonetheless understand their uh, or have an understanding of their emotions and experiences as well. Um, so. The Forever Project does that by um, not encouraging any kind of role playing, um, having that experience of having a dialogue with um, survivor, but also making it clear that this is this is a, not a dialogue with a survivor. So, so making it clear that this is a, a recording that's happened, say, in 2015, um, and that the, uh, the the student or, or the visitor is having a conversation that's that's mediated through a digital form. Um, so there's a kind of bank of questions that, that uh, the survivor can, so the, the testimony that the, the digital form draws on in order to answer questions from the students. Um, and what that means is you have that distance um, and that distance is really important um, for, for the kind of critical thinking and other oriented empathy um, that I think can, um, can foster what we actually want to happen with Holocaust education. I think that's a really positive message to wrap up our conversation, Sarah. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts and also some examples of good remembrance projects that work really well and that create that empathy that you were talking about. So Sarah Jones from the University of Birmingham, thank you again, and we wish you a good day. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to ask Vasily to come. We're going to do a change on the fly here because Vasily is going to come down into this living room space to lead a, a talk with one of our watch parties. So I'm going to make way for you here so you can go to one of, I think, both of our favorite cities in the world here. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We are going to Tokyo. Our watch party partner, Japan, is a country that has its own stories to tell about remembering the Second World War and the end of it. During a workshop in the Tokyo Holocaust Education Center, the participants learned about experiences of World War II survivors and transformed their impressions in an artistic way. And we now have the chance to go live to Tokyo to our, let's say, correspondent, Fumiko Ishioka. Hello. Hi, hello, Vasily, hi. Hi, Thank good to see you. Thank you for letting us join you. How are you? I'm very, very good and very happy that you're with us. Transformation and continuity are aspects that you've explored in your workshop. How have these aspects affected the way Japanese society remembers World War II? Um, we had a lot of discussions, uh, and uh, Vasily, I wonder if uh, uh, our participants can maybe introduce you to this one uh, person who went through the war period, uh, because that's the, that the person that we uh, spend a lot of time discussing and studying. And so, uh, Taolo, would you like to start? Yeah. So we read a testimony of Lee Hakrai from Korea, mm -hmm. which was under Japanese colonial rule. He was forced to work for war, war efforts as a Japanese. And also he was a camp guard and after the war, he was convicted of war crimes. After 11 years in prison, he was released and started living in Japan. We also read about his long life, long life battle for compensation from the Japanese government. So we've discussed what we should remember and how we should remember the testimony. And for Japanese youth like us, it was quite a new experience because we usually do not talk a lot about uh, the role of Japan as an, aggress uh, an aggressor. I thought it's, it's important to remember that there are still a lot of people who are waiting for an apology and compensation. And we'd like to uh, introduce some of the projects that we've created. So the first one is the study tour, to follow the path of Lee's life and his struggle. And the second project is a dialogue tour. The idea is to display letters and testimonies of those who went through the war. 
Visitors write letters reflecting on their own experiences that they gave in to the pressure for conformity and did not follow their conscience. There's one more project we'd like to introduce. And the Rust team proposed a museum in a taxi where you can run about race and rife story. And it, it functioned as a, a travel monument as well. And uh, what to highlight here is that um, it's accessible to lots of um, people in their daily lives. And um, actually, the taxi is a symbol of the race, rifts, rifts and uh, struggle in Japan after the war, since he made a living in Japan by running a taxi company. So, Vasily, we uh, actually planned too well. Was it OK to do a presentation like this? We yes, have of any course. Questions? It, was, it was very impressive and very creative. Um, I understand your aim was to create a memorial during the workshop. And, and these projects, will they come to life? Will, what, what, what will happen to them? Well, we just came up with this idea. And, uh, but uh, one thing that I wanted to share with you, Vasily, is that uh, uh, some comments from the Japanese speaking students. Mm -hmm. uh, during this process, one of the students said that it was quite painful to face with uh, this part of the history uh, of Japan as an aggressor. Uh, and the other student commented uh, on the, uh, you know, every gen generation has their own way of uh, remembrance. Uh, so their generation can come up with the new uh, innovative way they can be creative. Uh, but at the same time, one of the students said, wait a minute, but uh, on the way, something uh, could be lost on the way. So we are just uh, starting uh, this dialogue. Uh, I think uh, it's just the beginning for each one of us to uh, uh, yeah, continue more dialogue and do more looking back and think ahead. So really appreciate the opportunity. Fumiko, thank you so much for your perspectives, for this impressive presentation and greetings to Tokyo. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. And now, Sumi, back to you. Thank you, Vasily. Well, I want to move on to our next video because there are many people around the world, young people who actively participate in their society to ensure that they make a change for the better. And we're going to see one of those people, Alex. She's a young woman living in Berlin who started a project for and with refugees within her participation in the Anna Frank Ambassador Program. As an ambassador, she is committed to fighting for democratic values, so fighting against anti-Semitism, against racism, against discrimination. So let's take a look at her story. Just do it and never let anybody say to you that you can't do it. I'm Alex, I'm 21 years old. I'm living in Berlin and I came here for studying. And in my free time, I give private tuition to young pupils and I'm an Anne Frank ambassador since I'm 15 years old. The idea for my project Talk About It came at the Anne Frank workshop in Berlin. It was in 2015 and we had the plan to, to fight against prejudices and ban racism from our school. So we did a project in Sachsen-Anhalt. It was a little bit more the rural, a rural place and it was where I grew up and people were a little bit confused about the refugees who came to us. We wanted to ban prejudices and we invited the refugees to our school to have circles and talk about their stories and to show the pupils that they are individuals and that they are humans like you and me. Remembrance is very important because we can only develop and go on when we remember the past and one important thing is that we should never forget what happened. Don't only think about it, really do something and maybe create ideas what you can do, then search for a team, maybe three or five people, not so much, and then go to other people, tell them about what you want to do and why you want to do it, and then look for supporters, for example, politicians or sponsors who want to join your project, and then just do it and never let anybody say to you that you can't do it. 
If I could change the world, I would ban suffering and war, of course. And I would wish that people would be more open for other cultures and for new things and for other people. Thank you to Alex. What an inspiring message for young people around the world. Well, our, our live program is now coming to an end, if you can believe that. Uh, we had a great program where we learned about the importance of remembrance. We learned about innovative digital formats and how to take the past into the future. And I want to thank the guests that we had, of course, who joined us, Ava Hassel and uh, Sarah Jones as well, all the young people who contributed, and to our watch parties in Germany, Israel, and Japan as well. And we're going to continue with the third and final broadcast of Histicon 2021. That's going to be at, uh, live at 5 p.m. Central European time. And the topic is peace and how our world has been shaped by conflict and cooperation since 1945. Again, we will have inspiring clips. We will have watch party, uh, party partners, Algeria and Chile. And we have two fireside chats with researcher Ursula Schröder. She's a peace researcher and with Viola Benz from the project Peace Line. You can also expect music by the multilingual hip hop artist Tiger Trees from Germany. And there is tape that still working behind us and the guys will present their art piece, the finished art piece in our last show. We are going to prepare the last show and you now can enjoy one more time Mulai. Yeah. <laughs> 